Hey, check out what I found in the attic. <sighs> it's quite old. It's my Game Boy. I've played hundreds of hours while in the car on a long journey. Now let's see if it still works. Oh, the screen is completely broken. But the rest seems to work. Well, to be honest, the screen was never really good. It was yellowish, you needed a lot of sunlight to see anything on it, and the right angle. But, well, that's said. What did I play? Kirby Streamland 2. This was quite a nice game. The music was really awesome. But, well, that's done. What are you saying? You've built a compatible handheld console for the sole purpose of interoperability? Let me have a look. Ah, the GB Boy Color. Hmm. Let's test it. Put the game in it and start it. Well, the screen is decent, or half decent. It has colors, has a white background, and it has backlights. But this game doesn't seem to work. Let's use the magic trick and clean the contacts. Let's clean them decently. With, with some contact spray. And rub on the contacts. Let's test it again. Yeah, it works. I can play the game again. But 0%? I'm sure I already finished the game. Well, Play it again a bit. Now we finished the level. So, let's see. If we restart the console. Zero percent. Hmm. The game doesn't seem to save anymore the current progress. That's a shame. But let's debug it. Welcome to Kuvulu, the sorcery of copper. In this episode, we'll see how to replace the battery of a Game Boy cartridge. This can be done using a cell coin battery and some copper tape, or we can even fix tabs on a cell coin battery using a self made spot welder. Let's try to identify the problem. So here I've completed level 1 again, and I didn't see any glitch on the game. It seems to work perfectly. There was no bug, there was no freezing, so the game seems alright. So, we have some progress, and what we can do is reset the game by pressing A, B, select and start. So this resets the game, and if we start it again, we can see that we are at 2%. So actually, the game is working fine. I mean. It knows about the progress and it can somehow save it. Now, as you can see here, we can continue the game with level 1 already completed. And let's check it. Here, we see level 1 is completed. Now, the issue is whenever I switch off the console and switch it back on. And if we restart the game, up, so this is starting the game press start, we can see we're at 0%. So the save is lost whenever we power cycle the whole device. Now the Game Boy and also this Game Boy clone cannot save the game on the handheld console itself. It doesn't have any memory. The games were always saved on the cartridges themselves. So whenever you give your cartridge, you give also your save game. And now we know that there is some kind of issue with power and this is when the save got lost. So the, uh, the issue is in the cartridge and has to do something with power. So let's open the cartridge and let's see what's inside. The only thing holding the cartridge together is this screw here. And as you can see, there's some kind of special pattern. You cannot use any normal screwdriver to open it. So what I did is go through my bits and none of them was working. Closest I could find was this one. But the slit was a bit too narrow. So what I did is, with a file, make the, the slit bigger. If we put it on a screwdriver, it fits enough so you can go through the, on the hole to the side and open the game. Slide the front cover down and here we are on the inside. Let's have a closer look.
So the game is actually a PCB with the gold plated fingers. This is the ROM. This is where the game is inside and this is what gets executed. Next to it you have the MBC memory bank controller. This helps to extend the capacity of the ROM or the addressable memory actually so you can have bigger games. So this is the RAM. This is where the program is actually executed, where the variables are stored and changed and this is where the save game is saved. The last components you see here are the battery and this small chip here. What this small chip does is whenever there is no power anymore on the pins, so power coming from the console, then it will switch to this internal battery and this internal battery will power the SRAM so it can keep the memory and this way we have a safe game. Now if we use a multimeter and measure the battery, we see that there's only 80 milliwatt remaining. So this battery is dead and this explains also why it cannot keep our safe game. What we need to do is replace this battery. This battery is a CR1616 as described here on the circuit board. So C stands is a letter standing for the chemical, in this case it's lithium. So this is a 3 volt coin cell. R, this is just because the battery is round. And then the first 16 is the width of the coin cell, so 16 millimeter. And the second 16 is the thickness of the battery, so 1.6 millimeter. I didn't have any CR1616 there. The only closest battery I had was a CR2016. So this means that instead of having a width of 16 millimeter, we have a width of 20 millimeter. But it still fits pretty nice on the PCB without shorting anything. So we can use this battery instead and solder it on the PCB. The problem is that this battery comes with metal tabs which are holding the battery and which are very useful to solder on the board. So it was soldered using these metal tabs. The board doesn't have any slot to insert the coin, so we have to find a way how to fix this coin cell battery to the board. Somehow, no matter what I do, if I try to solder on the battery, you see it doesn't stick to it, it keeps on my iron. And even if I put some flux to help with the activation, the solder just doesn't stick to this battery. I don't know what kind of special coating it had, and I cannot solder on it. Also. Soldering is probably not the best idea because the heat will damage the chemistry inside the battery. So I need to find something else. My second solution was to use copper tape. So this is really flexible copper rolled and which you can use as tape. Here, so you can stick on one side and the surface is conductive. As you can see here. And that's true also for the sticky part. Although it is a bit harder probe it because there's some sticky layer if you put a bit you see that it works and it goes through the material also so with that you just use copper tape and tape it to the battery on both sides enough so with enough surface so it holds to the battery then you have small tabs which you can solder on the PCB check the voltage it should be above 3 volts and just put a bit of glue so it holds well on the board. And now, as you can see, the game is still saved, although I switched on and off the console. So with that, the job is done. We now replace the battery in the game and it works pretty well, including save states. So I could end the video here. But actually I wanted to use the opportunity to carry on because this copper tape solution works pretty well for our case. So even if there is some resistance between the battery and the copper tape because of the sticky glue which is in there, it doesn't really matter here because the amount of current is so tiny that the voltage drop will be just, we can just ignore it. But I wanted to use the opportunity to actually have something as professional as this. So really have metal bars fixed to the battery. And how they do this is by using spot welding. You see the two spots here? This is where this metal bar has been welded to this battery. You can see the same on the back side. And what this allows is to have really strong fixing on the bar. So this is particularly useful if you have some shaking, rattling, or if you want to fix it somewhere really firmly. 
and also it allows to have a large current going through. So for this case it's not really important, but very often on large lithium iron battery this is exactly how it's done, just by spot welding piece of metal. So let's see if we can do this ourselves. What we first need is something capable of delivering a large amount of energy, but we want to do it only in a small spot. This might look nice because it makes sparks, but actually sparks can't weld shit. This is just high voltage, but that's not a lot of energy. To weld metals, we need to melt them together. And to melt them, we need high temperatures. For high temperatures, we require high power. Now we know that in a circuit, the power is equal to the resistance times the current squared. So what we need is not a circuit capable of delivering high voltages, but a circuit capable of delivering high currents. And with that, we can heat up metals and even melt it. Capacitors can charge and discharge very rapidly and this is exactly what we are using them for. But this also means that they can deliver a lot of current in a very short amount of time. So for example if I put this small wire between the two leads and if I switch the power supply on we can see it is shorted and it is only drawing 7 milliamps and no nothing is happening. Now if I let the capacitor charge now it is fully charged and if I short again the leads with a small wire, you can see small arcs. So it means that ah, it means that it is welding and it, you can even see that it melted the cable, the small wire and it even welded one part of the small wire on the lead. So capacitors are ideal for what we need. The problem is that this capacitor will not be able to melt the metal. So this has only 470 microfarads at 16 volts. This corresponds to 60 millijoules of energy. And that will not be enough to melt parts of this metal. Now we need something which can store more energy and this is where supercapacitors come into play. For example, this supercapacitor is only rated at 5.5 volts but it can store 1 farad of energy. So that's a lot more than the 470 microfarads of this capacitor. This Supercapacitor can have 15 joules of energy, which is quite a lot. But we can even have larger. This supercapacitor is rated at 2.7 volts, but for 100 farads. And this corresponds to around 365 joules of energy, which is really a lot. And it will probably be enough to melt these pills of metal. Now, this is still less energy that this than stored on a AAA battery. These kinds of batteries store around 6,000, 6,500 joules. But even if this one only stores 300 joules, the, it's a supercapacitor, so it can deliver a large amount of current in a very small amount of time. And this is what we're looking for to really weld these pieces rapidly on the battery. So let's test out the supercapacitor. Because supercapacitor can store a lot of energy, they can deliver a large amount of current for a couple of seconds. And as we will see here, whenever I discharge, we see that it starts with 100 amps and then it goes lower and lower. But it was able to deliver a large amount of current for a couple of seconds. To charge our supercapacitor, we will use this voltage management voltage regulator board. It is based on an LM2596, so power is coming in through the voltage regulator board and then coming out. It is outputting two volts. The blue LED tells us that we are in constant voltage. So this is the maximum voltage. And the first potentiometer allows us to adjust the output voltage. Whenever I short the output, we see that now we are in constant current mode and the first red LED is on, meaning we're in constant current mode. And currently it is outputting two dots 2 amps. And here we can see that we are not at the maximum voltage. This potentiometer allows you to set the maximum current. So now if we charge the capacitor, it is drawing some current, meaning it is charging the capacitor. The third LED here tells us when the capacitor is charged OK for us. It is actually a threshold on the current. So if I increase the middle potentiometer, I set the threshold and you can see we are on the verge of the threshold. So if I increase it, the LED charging LED is off and the constant voltage LED is on, meaning we are charged. 
and there we have our circuit. So here we have power coming in, going through our voltage regulator, charging manager, and coming out into the supercapacitor. And the supercapacitor on the supercapacitor, I've soldered two leads coming from some probes, and this gives me very pointy and sharp ends. Well, not too sharp, I can touch it. Also, I can touch the leads. It won't damage me or because it's only 2.7 volts and the surface skin resistance is very high, so there, there isn't any significant amount of current going through. But for metal, it's a bit better. So now we want to spot weld something on battery. For that, we also use this metal strip. So this is nickel plated strip, or you can have also pure nickel, and this is what's really solid on the batteries. You can cut it with the scissors into small bands, like this. If I take the band, you know, put it on the battery, and we briefly make contact just to make some spot weldings. And it's not perfect through the camera, but as you can see, focuses, we can see some spot welding marks. And it is holding on the battery, so it's stable enough. It is not professional, so if you put some force, you can still remove it. But for that, it's also very easy. It's very small, it's portable, and it's very cheap. If you want some very professional spot welding, then you should use any other circuit. But for all needs, this is plenty sufficient. And with that, we can now prepare batteries to save even more games. While going through my games, I landed on this one, Pokemon. This is the game that marked the end of my childhood. And to my surprise, the battery is still okay, even after almost 20 years, it is still at 3.1 volt. And this means that I still have my 150 Pokemons. Enjoy!